This is the Millennials and Multifamily Podcast, brought to you by Kronos Investment Partners. We interview industry experts to unlock key information that will help young professionals break into the multifamily world in order to create long-term and short-term wealth. If you enjoyed the show, please head over to iTunes and leave a rating and written review so we can reach more listeners. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Millennials and Multifamily Podcast. I'm your host, John Stover, with my co-host, Fritz Ritter, and today our guest is Charles Seaman. Charles is the Senior Acquisition Manager and Asset Manager of Three Oaks Management, in which he works to find underperforming multifamily assets across the Southeast United States. Charles does everything from the company's initial underwriting to contract negotiation to capital raising to asset management. Charles Seaman. Thank you so much for joining us on today's episode of the Millennials and Multifamily Podcast. Could you give us and our listeners just a little bit about your background, you know, how you got into real estate investing? Yes, absolutely, John. So thank you very much for having me. So for my background, it goes back to 2005 and it was really kind of, for lack of a better term, stumbling into it than intentionally seeking it out. And it started with me working for a guy who was a commercial real estate investor in Midtown Manhattan. And I was fortunate to work with him for 14 years and work with him in roles that were very close and learn a lot. Uh, initially, at that time, I was 20, 20 years old. And for lack of a better term, I was young, dumb, and broke. And I needed a job that would pay the bills. And uh, that seemed to fit the bill. So I started there. And lo and behold, I didn't quite know what I would get into over the next 14 years. But overall, it was a very good learning experience. And it was one that led me to believe that I wanted to eventually go off on my own into commercial real estate. So uh, my role there, he, the, the gentleman I worked for owned several different businesses. He also owned you know, a plumbing company, some bars and restaurants, various commercial real estate properties. And, and my role really helped manage all of his different properties and businesses. And on the, on the real estate side, I was involved in everything from acquisitions to you know, finding tenants, getting spaces leased, managing properties, getting them funded. So really the whole gamut from start to finish. And of the different businesses that I was involved in there, I always gravitated most to real estate because you know, even though there's a lot of money in construction, uh, I realized that I don't necessarily want to do that forever because it's always high stress. And while there is stress in real estate, it's a different and, in my opinion, much more manageable type of stress. So I said, you know what, I'd rather go for that. And uh, fast forward about 10 years. You know, when I first started there, I only intended to be there two or three years, but then eventually I started doing better for myself and perhaps got too complacent. And I said to myself, well, you know, I'm not getting any younger. When I first came here, my goal was eventually to go out and do my own thing. And I said, it's time to put those wheels in motion. So around 2014 or 15, I started dabbling into some single family stuff. And I, I quickly determined that I really didn't like single family. And for a couple of reasons, one, I was already familiar with commercial real estate because I was doing that as part of my full-time job. And two, um, you know, I, I just had more of a skill set for it because the skill set that you need to be successful with commercial real estate is different than the skill set you need for single family. And there are some things that overlap, but there are some things that are vastly different. So admittedly, I really didn't have the desire to go out and learn a brand new skill set. Uh, but I also knew that I didn't have the budget to go out and buy commercial real estate. So that was kind of the crossroads I was at. And after a few months of dabbling into single family and wholesaling and determining, well, this really isn't what I like. So let's try something different. I happened to get lucky. And once again, in my life, I stumbled onto syndication. And as I started learning more about that, I said, oh, this is interesting. I can make this work. I could use the skill set that I already have. And I could pursue commercial real estate, which I like a lot better. And I could use other people's money. So I said, this, this could kind of be the best of both worlds. And fast forward, lo and behold, in 2017, I started working on it part-time. And we continued doing so for the next two years. And then from 2000, around the end of May 2019, I left my full-time job. And I now still have a part-time job. I'd love to say I'm jobless, but not yet. And I put a lot of time into the multifamily syndication business because that's really my main priority. And that's something I'm looking to make a big splash with in 2021. So for the person who's asking themselves, how is man, you know, how doesn't property management translate from single family to, uh, to multifamily, I guess, how come the skill sets didn't completely translate between the two? So, so the thing is, a lot of times with commercial, there's just more facets to it. 
So single family, for a few reasons, tends to be smaller in scale. One, because the, the deals themselves are smaller in scale. And two, you don't have the, the money available to have the depth of a team that you do in commercial. So in commercial, you could focus on one or two things, and you could be really good at those things. Uh, whereas with single family, you kind of have to be a jack of all trades. And, and also, you need different skill sets. So a lot of times on single family, if you're dealing direct with seller, you know, you're probably going to need to be a very strong negotiator. You're going to be need to be organized and really follow up with different things. And some of those same skills you do need in the commercial set also. Um, and some of, the, some of those things I'm, I am good with, but I realized, you know, there, there were certain things I just didn't like about single family. And, and to me personally, I, I'd rather deal with a broker than a seller directly most times. So I find that I do better with that. And I've always been more of a relationship salesperson than a transactional one. So I do a very good job selling people once I get to know them and, and have relationships with them, then I can continually sell them on an ongoing basis. But I'll probably never be the guy to sell a one-off transaction and just move on to the next one. So, so commercial is definitely more relationship-based where single family is very transactional. Yeah, um, I can I can definitely see that for sure. <laughs> um, so what role do you feel now in multifamily? Um, now it's kind of your, you have that team around you. What's your role? Sure. So in my team, what I do is, so my, my primary role is the acquisitions. And I focus on finding deals, doing the underwriting, building broker relationships, and just staying on top of those things. I also serve as the asset manager for our team. So I serve a dual role. Uh, eventually, as we continue growing, we'll probably have to hire at least one of those roles out. But for the time being, I, I wear two hats. Oh, this is this is perfect for me. I'm going to be completely selfish here. Good. Um, <laughs> Always are. So, <laughs> right. So I'm kind of a spreadsheet jockey myself. And I'm wondering, since you do both the underwriting and the asset management, do you view those as like two sides of the same coin? Because to underwrite property, I feel like you have to know how to manage it. But to manage it, you're also being held accountable to the underwriting. You know, it, it, it's definitely a good way to look at it, John. So the thing is, it, it, it doesn't hurt, that's for sure. So what I would say is if you're a smaller operation and you have the ability to do both, I think that it definitely gives you an advantage because there's more continuity, at least hopefully. You know, hopefully if one person is doing both things, there's, there's less that falls through the cracks. But eventually as you scale, you, you know, you won't be able to fill both roles. There's just will be too much going on. But I think it definitely does help. You know, underwriting something from a realistic standpoint is always better than using textbook knowledge. And, and that's with anything, you know. So like the guy that I used to work for was a contractor. You know what? There are certain things that I knew just from you know, being in the business long enough and kind of saying, okay, we can do certain things this way. But what I also know is that I'm not a contractor. And, and I always joke around and say, you know, I, I, you know, I, I couldn't fix anything. My, my extent of handiwork is changing a light bulb. And given that, you know, I'm not the best person to go out there and provide an estimate because even though I may have a general idea, I don't have that practical experience. So, so that's where it helps, you know, as you're saying, so knowing how to run these properties and how, where the pitfalls are, that does give me an advantage with the underwriting because I can say, okay, we need to account for this and we need to budget for certain things up front that we have that factored into our, our underwriting. Well, you can change one more light bulb than I can. <laughs> <laughs> Numbers, people. No, I'm not. So of those two roles, which ones would you try to outsource first as you start to grow your company? Asset management. So I like both roles, but the truth is I like the acquisition side better. So most people tend to be more of a starter or a finisher. And admittedly, I'm always more of a starter. I'm great at starting, uh, sometimes not as great at finishing. So I, I find more excitement and I get more of a thrill out of starting. Yeah. And I, I, no, I'm doing a bit of both right now. And the asset management definitely takes up a lot of time for a long time. You know what? It definitely does. I have to admit when we had... One or two, like, like, like our first asset, okay, it wasn't so bad. Um, second asset, you know, a little more. Now we're getting a third one that we're closing on shortly. So I said, okay, you know, I realized this is going to start adding up pretty quick. <laughs> and I said, eventually, I'm not going to be able to do both because there's only so much time in the day. <laughs> right. That leads great into my next question. Um, so since you are wearing two hats, what are some systems maybe you've created to kind of lessen your workload and automate some things on both sides. So I'd love to tell you, Fritz, that I had a good answer for that. Uh, that's actually something I'm still working on myself, but lessen my workload would 
would probably be a, a flat out lie. Uh, at this point, I, I think I put in you know, 40 or 60 hours a week with this. And uh, <laughs> my, my system is basically a spreadsheet. You know, we're in the process in our company currently of trying to automate some different things, but we, we haven't quite got there fully yet. Uh, but there are things that we're doing over the next few months that will hopefully do that. What I would say is I'm far from a tech guru. So I, I generally stick with spreadsheets and probably need to get a little more tech friendly than I am. Oh, my God. You you and me. <laughs> <laughs> You're two peas in a pod. Fritz is like my IT guy. I was going to say, I think I know someone <laughs> just like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So cool. Let, let's, uh, let's get into underwriting. I always like to talk with people and just ask like what is their underwriting like approach and philosophy when they're mm-hmm. looking at these deals some people look for cash flow other people look look at these deals as like flips you know what how do you view them so there's a couple of things i would say i think with any syndication to be successful you need a mix of both so you'll need some cash flow and you'll need a lot of pop on the on the sale now you know my my conventional training in real estate is that cash flow is always king and I think there's a lot of truth to that because you know what you'll you'll never get broke you never go broke having cash flow come in every month and there's truth to that. Uh, now, what I would say on the syndication side, from the way that a lot of the modeling is built, you know, a lot of times you are giving the lion's share of the the cash flow to the investors, and that's not a bad thing. You know, they're putting the money up, so obviously they want some reward for that. And you know, a lot of times you know you're seeing deals that are cutting it pretty close to the preferred return. You know, maybe you get a little bit above that, but it's nothing that the the GP is going to live off of. So even with the investors, you know, two things, one, eventually they, they, most times they do want their money back. And two, they're going to get usually more bang for their buck on the sale than they will on the cash flow. So the cash flow is like what kind of whets their appetite in between. And then the, the sales, what really gets them salivating. Cause they're like, Oh wow, this is, this is where I make the big money. Uh, with the only caveat being that, you know, we, we can, we can control the operation of the property, None of us can control the market, so we don't know when the market's going to turn, when it's going to dip, and when it's going to continue moving upward. So we can only adjust and pivot as we as we see those conditions. So most times we would shoot for – in the past, we'd sh- shoot for a two- to five-year hold. Now we're shooting more three to seven years with our underwriting. And even though we like value-aid deals, for me personally, what I would always say is I would prefer an operational value-aid to a physical value-aid any day of the week. And, and I would say personally, I would, I would probably take them seven days a week and twice on Sunday. Um, <laughs> if, if there's management place, something we can go in there and do simple. I, you know, I think that they're great because you're taking less risk than if you're going out there and doing a physical, on, uh, a physical rehab, just because there's less money involved. So the challenge with the physical rehab is that while there could potentially be a lot of value, sometimes market conditions do change. And right now we're at a point in the cycle where there's a lot of uncertainty and while I don't personally think that multifamily is going to experience a downturn, I could be wrong. There, there, there is a slim chance, but I could be wrong. So we have to protect against that and do whatever we can to make smart decisions for ourselves and our investors to protect their money. Uh, for instance, we had a deal we closed last year. And one of the things I really liked about it is that the the rents on the property were between 575 and 650 when we bought it. And from doing some research and checking out the comps in the area, we, we felt confident that similar units were renting for seven fifty. dollars So that's what we were targeting. Uh, good news is we're four months in as we record this. And our property manager said that she thought even seven fifty dollars was very conservative, but I have to admit I didn't quite believe her at first. And I'm glad to say that I was wrong. And she's proven me wrong because now we're renting vacant units at eight fifty. dollars Wow. And um, that was all operational. So those units were in good condition. You know, we're not spending any money on them. We're doing a standard turn. Somebody moves out, we slap a coat of paint on, you know, maybe fix anything that may be wrong with uh, anything in the apartment, which is a standard turn and we're bumping rents pretty significantly. So in terms of underwriting, what I would say is initially, when you do initial underwriting, I would say, for me, it probably takes me 10 to 15 minutes. And I think for most people, after you've done a few, you can usually do them somewhere in that, in that time frame. And where the real work with underwriting is, is in the follow-up. And that's what I always tell people. So you're going to be making some basic assumptions when you do your initial underwriting. I just look at the initial one as taking the numbers that the seller provides me and putting them into an organized format. And then from that point, I'm saying, okay, well, what questions do I have? So... When you're underwriting, what I usually tell people to do 
is you want to figure out what story are the numbers telling you and, and what's happening. So for me, I like to see a T12. You know, you, you could underwrite using just a standard P&L statement, but to me, it makes it a lot tougher because you're not getting the full story. Uh, you're getting all the numbers consolidated into one. I, I want to look at it and say, okay, well, why did collections dip, dip in Mar- March and April? What happened here? Uh, and you know, not referring to 2020 because you know, that would be self-explanatory, but in, in a more normal year where it's not that cut and dry. You know, so, so what event caused this to happen? So you want to have things that you get there that you can go back to the broker or the seller with and say, okay, Mr. Broker or Mr. Seller, tell me what happened here. Just let me understand the story of the property so that way I know what I'm buying. And, and, and as syndicators, I would say that's really our duty to our investors because we want to make sure that we're protecting their money and also our own reputation and any money we have in it. So we, we want to really do our thorough due diligence and be clear on every little aspect of what those numbers tell us. That is amazing. So I got another question while you were talking because uh, you went really deep into that. So first question is, what are some common findings you see in the T12 that really stand out to you that really kind of perk your ears of like, oh, I need to investigate this more? So what I would say is every T12 is a little bit different. So, so I don't know that anything will be truly common per se, but the big things that always you know, make my ears perk up are, are definitely dips in collections. So if, if collections are consistent for nine or 10 months throughout the year, and then they dropped into, and you're always going to have fluctuations. So when I say a drop, I mean like a, a significant drop, you know, not, not within, you know, a couple hundred bucks of each other, you know, you're always going to have some movement. Uh, but if it's, you know, if, let's say if it's 52,000 in June, 53,000 July, and then all of a sudden in August, it drops to 44,000. Well, what happened here to cause that dip? You know, so, so you want to understand what's causing that. And is there any type of issue that the seller is not telling you about that you need to be aware of. And, and that's what the numbers will tell you. And, and same thing on the expenses. So if you see any expenses that are very inconsistent, so for instance, if the, if the water bill is, you know, let's just say $100 for you know, three months, and then all of a sudden it jumps to $3,000, well, what caused the spike that month? Was there a leak? You know, is there something that happened? You know, so things that, that could potentially be red flags, and other, other little things that I always look out for, and these are less common, but still things that always make my ears perk up. Anytime on the expenses that I see anything with either mold extraction, water extraction, uh, water removal, any type of security service, those are always things that catch my attention because I always say, okay, what do I need to find out about the property? What do I need to find out about the area? Even if those expenses are small, uh, they're things that always make me zone in on them. And I'm like, okay, you know what? We need to focus on things that could potentially be costly or problematic. That was just the answer I was looking for. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so I wanted to go back to what you said about a management play. And I really just kind of wanted to understand what does that include for the management play? A lot of people have an idea of what a renovation is, right? You bump rents 50, 100, $150. What does mm-hmm. a management play include? You know, it's funny you mentioned that because I know even as we explain this to our investors at times, it, it, it's tough conceptually because a lot of people can't wrap their heads around it. And the common question you get is, well, what are you going to do differently than the previous management? And, and, and how will you manage it better? And a lot of times, perhaps there may not be a good answer for it because, you know, how do you explain that to somebody? Um, but a management play is something that you can do to realize an efficiency that the previous management company missed. So like that 48 unit property I was saying we closed on, that one had a, a, a few different management plays and that one was kind of glaring because the management company just wasn't doing a good job with it. So that made it a lot easier to go in there and say, okay, there, there were two major issues. One is that when we first started looking at the property, the property was 75% occupied, which on a 48 unit property to have 12 vacant units, that's a lot. Uh, thankfully, that became stabilized and allowed us to close with agency debt. But initially that was one of our two big value ads, which they beat us to it and did it before we closed. So I was even happier with that. Um, but th- there was a few things. One is that the manager there was managing four different properties. Uh, the other three of which were all local, but the, the other three were also owned by the property management company where this one wasn't. And this one here kind of seemed to be the redheaded stepchild because it, you know, probably wasn't getting the attention that the other three were. And also because the leasing office was at one of the other properties 
And while the property we bought was nice, when I went to the leasing office to do the lease audit, I realized that if I was driving there, I'd rather lease a unit at that property. So uh, I probably wasn't going to go back to the property I was buying if I was going over there. <laughs> uh, so, so, so those were a couple of things. And also they were advertising for tenants in the print version of the newspaper, which in 2020 is probably not the most effective way to market for tenants of, of, of real estate properties. So those were things we realized we could pick up on and do better with. And then aside from that, we also realized that the units were just undervalued for what they were what they could have been in the area. And initially we, we were kind of doubting it, but then as we looked at all the comps, we were able to go out there and say, okay, this comp is getting this, this comp is getting that, you know, similar floor plan, similar year built, similar layout. So that was information that we presented in our investment summary to the investors. And we said, listen, you know, we feel very confident presenting this to you because this is what all these other properties are getting. We have hard data here that shows it. So we can, we can present that to you confidently and say, okay, Here's where we can do better managing it that the previous manager couldn't. And, and sometimes just the little things that, that make all the difference, but, but th that's really what a management play is. Are you struggling to understand how to underwrite multifamily properties? Hi, I'm John Stober, and I completely understand your problem. I thought underwriting would come naturally to me due to my background in finance and accounting, but I quickly found out that there aren't a lot of resources that cover this subject. I had no idea whether what I was doing was right, wrong, or just original. I don't want you to have to pick up little nuggets here and there like I did. So I wrote an ebook called How to Analyze Big Apartment Buildings and Make Them Feel Small that puts together all the pieces of the puzzle. We're also giving away a deal analyzer with the ebook, and they're both completely free. Don't wait as long as I did to start chasing financial freedom. Go to BIT dot l y forward slash underwriting ebook and get your free copy today so when you're underwriting deals do you focus more on growing the income or reducing expenses or is it even Both. for you even I, I i would say i so, so 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 my personal thought is i don't care how i get to the end result as long as i get to the end result and it works and whether it's increasing income, reducing expenses, or a combination of both, uh, I would say, you know, do, do what makes sense and is reasonable and achievable. So the reason I ask that is because right now with property values going up so much, the taxes usually go up a lot mm -hmm. in most markets. Insurance is usually going up and a lot of owners are running them really lean I personally have not seen that many opportunities to reduce expenses without jeopardizing the property. Now the expense ratio may decrease as income goes up, but like the actual dollar amount of expenses also increases. What expenses are you finding that you know you can reduce with more efficient management? So it really depends on the property. If, it, if it's a property that's already running lean, there's probably not much you'll be able to. Uh, if it's, but there, there's a lot of properties that are high. So for me, I look at the expenses more on a per unit basis than I do as a percentage of income. Mm -hmm. I, I always find that using them as a percentage of income is good for like back of the napkin math. But like when people say, oh, it, it should be 50% of, of income. I say, no, it shouldn't. <laughs> you, you have to know what you're talking about because it's going to vary widely from market to market. Right. Uh, so while there is some truth to that as a general rule, keep in mind, that's only a general rule. So the markets that you're looking in most frequently, what you want to do is get to know what the expenses should be running at for similar assets. And the best way to do that is by contacting property management companies. So what I always tell people is you want to have you know, at least one or two property management companies that you have good relationships with in each market you're looking at. And you want to be able to go to them and bounce ideas with them and say, you know, listen, where do you think I should be able to run these expenses at? So and I'm just using an example. Let's say if we're looking at a property somewhere in the Southeast and it's a property that has full-time staff and maintenance and turnover are running at 750 a unit. So I would say, you know what? That's pretty high. So the first thing I would do is find out why they're running at 750 a unit and say, okay, is there some type of problem? Maybe there's a lot of maintenance issues and it needs to run at this and I can't reduce that. But if, if I do some research and I go back to the broker and we, we find out that no, the seller's just mismanaging it and they're misallocating the, uh, 
their, their assets, then we can, we can manage that more efficiently because you can typically run that somewhere between 550 and 600 a unit. So, so things like that and just really knowing the numbers and knowing the markets will go a long way and saying, okay, where should the numbers be versus where are they actually? Now, there are some numbers you can't really do much with, taxes being a big one, as you said. So, so certain states are what they call point to sale states, meaning they, they reassess the tax values the year after the sale. And you know, like South Carolina is one of those. And I, I say that because we invest there. Uh, so for instance, something like that, you know, unfortunately, there's not much I can do to fight the taxes. You know, you, you could appeal certain things, but you're not going to generally be too successful on, a, on an appeal that's done after a sale. <laughs> there is going to typically be some increase and you have to factor that into your budget. So sometimes the increase that you experience in tax may wipe away the other offset that you would have from reducing other expenses. So if your property management company gives you, let's, let me take that back. Like we're looking at a deal right now, for example, property management company has a unique structure that's actually a little bit cheaper than anything else that we've seen. Would you run your numbers with that property management structure or would you run the market structure just in case I, that property manager? I personally manager would didn't... prefer the market structure mm-hmm. just in case you need to fire that property manager. <laughs> right. And that's, that's what I'm getting at. So you're, you're just taking the market rates mm-hmm. and then you're, you're making those your expenses. And if you can run it leaner than that, it's your upside. Right. So, so, so you never want to budget something where it's unrealistic. So if, if you're in a market where you should be running, and I'm just using an example, $4,500 a unit for C properties, that, then you don't want to be running them at $3,500 a unit because you're probably cutting something that you need. Mm-hmm. And do you talk about payroll too? How are you determining whether you know, a property has adequate staff or if you can actually take someone away or if you need to add someone? So- the first thing I would look at, I would look at two things. One is the overall dollar amount to the payroll. So most markets I find, especially here in the Southeast, I mean, you're probably looking at somewhere between $900 per unit on the low side to, depending on the market, maybe as high as like fifteen dollars or 1600 on the high side per unit. So I'd like to see where the dollar amount is in relation to, you know, to that. And then secondly, I would look at actually the number of people they have. So the general rule of thumb is that if you have a hundred unit property, you probably want to have one, one person in the office and one person for maintenance. So for every 50 units, you go up above that. You want to consider adding additional personnel. Of course, you, you want to make sure that tenants are happy. You want to make sure they have the ability to lease units if they're coming in to do so. And you want to make sure that if they're submitting work orders, they're not waiting a week and a half to get them service. Cause if they do, they'll probably move out and go elsewhere. And so is there anything you're doing to adjust your underwriting right now during COVID? So th- there's been a lot of adjusting for sure. I've definitely done some pivoting and, and, and I've been playing with different things to see what works. Uh, so right now, and I've kind of seen a lot of other groups do this, so I've been doing it as well. I've been using 0% rent increases for year one, 2% for year two, and 3% year three on. So at least what that does is it gives us some protection in years one and two, because we don't want to be budgeting for full on increases. Now, now, what I would say is there are a lot of markets where increases still are being realized. And I think that's great, but I would look at that as more of a bonus than something I would actually factor in. So if the numbers work without it, great. Then if you actually get that higher number, it's just gravy on there. And it's something that can go into the pot for distribution. Uh, and what I would also do is I would say to me personally, I, w- I would, for anything I am looking at with a renovation budget, I would try and trim the renovation budget as much as I can. And when I say that, I don't mean trim it down to the point where you don't have any cushion. Uh, for me personally, I always budget with a lot of cushion, probably more than I should. But the thing is, you, you, if there's things that aren't going to bring you a significant increase in value and you're not going to see a direct increase in rent premium for it then I would say maybe consider not doing that item because now's the time to keep things lean. It's not the time to be putting in, in most cases, ten, twelve, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 a unit, unless you just have a, a real steal of a deal that you got in a great area. But you know, I think you want to be in the four to $6,000 per unit range if you're looking at renovations. So, you, so it's a good time for modest renovations and not for full scale ones, unless you just have that great steal. So what does that modest renovation look like? What does that four to $6,000 do in a unit? So it don't really vary from property to property, but I mean, a lot of times 
you know, you may wind up doing some upgrades to the cap, the cabinets and countertops, kitchens and bathrooms, are usually the two big things people notice. So you want to see what you can do in those two rooms that'll, that'll make it pop and get a premium on the rent, but not kill the budget. So maybe it means instead of replacing the cabinets, maybe you're just painting the boxes and putting new doors on and new hardware. Uh, maybe you're putting new lighting fixtures in, you know, throughout the Southeast, most, most units are using LVP flooring at this point. So if the units don't have those, you may rip up whatever is there and put LVP in. So little things like that, that stand out to people. And for the most part, I would say attract like a millennial type tenant base, which is what I think most of us are probably going for at this point, because that's your, your predominant rent to base right now. And, and then getting them to pay a little more for that. So so when you said you're not assuming any rent bumps in year one, are you also not assuming any renovations in year one, unless it's a down unit? You know what, for, for me personally, I, I've seen groups do that, but I, I would, I'd be okay doing the renovations in year one because my thought is I would rather deploy that capital if we are going to budget for it sooner than later. I, I don't want it just sitting on the books uh, and not doing anything. Right. So I, I'd rather put it to work that – even if we don't necessarily wind up getting, now, now, l- l- let me correlate this and say there's two different bumps you're going to get. So when I'm saying 0% bumps, that's an organic bump. But if you're doing an upgrade, that's going to be separate from your organic bump. So the organic bump is just something that keeps you in pace with the market. And it may be a 2 or 3% annual increase based on whatever market you're looking at. But if you are talking about an additional bump that comes from a physical value add, then that's something I would factor in because you can still get that. So if you're renting a unit that has, you know, that looks like it came out of the mid 1980s and all of a sudden you go in there and do an upgrade to it, I think it's fair to expect that people are willing to pay more for it because they're seeing a different product. And so are you getting, are you taking all the bump immediately once it's leased up or are you maybe assuming a lighter rent bump when you lease up? but then a higher growth rate for the renovated units throughout the hold period. I would take the, the, the full bump up front. And what I would do is also be cognizant that depending on the size of the property you're looking at, keep in mind that if you're looking at a 300 unit property, it's not realistic to assume that you're going to upgrade all 300 units in one year. So you have to be cognizant of phasing and budget for that. And some people forget that, I think. So if you have 300 units, you're probably looking at a three-year project because you're going to have a lot of different factors that play into it. One of which is leases. So, you know, you have to wait till your current leases expire. I mean, you you could theoretically buy tenants out, but that would be extremely expensive and I wouldn't recommend that. So, you know, you're doing your upgrades as, as units turn. So when tenants move out just in the normal course of business, so instead of doing your standard turn, now you're saying, okay, we're going to upgrade the cabinets. We're going to put new flooring down. So you do a little bit more and you do it at that same time. So it takes you a little bit longer. It costs you a little more and you do something of it as CapEx. And then what happens is all of a sudden you're able to realize that bump right away. So whatever units you renovate in year one, you can take that full bump in year one. Then whatever units you renovate in year two, same thing for that. Just make sure that you're not taking all of them in year one if you're doing a property where it's not realistic to do all that in the first year. But the broker said I could renovate all of them in year one. What do you mean? That's true. (laughs) Now, (laughs) as much as we always want to listen to the broker, and we do, but but we want to take it with a grain of salt. So so keep in mind, especially for anybody new listening to this, um, a broker's job is to sell you the deal. And when we're the seller, we want them doing that same thing on our behalf. Uh, but they're, they're not the person renting the deal or supervising the renovation. So take the sales information from the broker, take the rental information from the property manager because they'll be the one doing it. And, and ideally, if you have a renovation going on, you'll probably have a property manager company that has the experience for that. So lean on them and use their experience and, and let them guide you accordingly with that. Yeah. Um, I've had a lot of instances where brokers have said year one, we get the rent bump and it's been very unrealistic. Um, but yeah, I wanted to ask you about um, on the asset management side, how have you adjusted to COVID? Has that changed at all? Thankfully, no. Um, I, I, I have to admit in March of 2020, I was pretty nervous. Uh, we only had one asset at the time, the second one on the contract. And our asset at that time was a workforce housing property, and, and we still have that one. Uh, I was a bit nervous because I'm saying, boy, this could be a real mess. 
And, and all you can do is really stay on top of it. And keep in mind for anybody listening, asset management is different than property management. So I'm not out there knocking on doors or, or you know, supervising work orders or things like that. Now, if there came a point where we needed to do that, would I step in and do it? Absolutely. But, but it's not something that I would do on an ongoing basis. So that's the property manager's role. As the asset manager, our job essentially is to manage the manager. And what we do is we have to stay in communication with them. And, and we do that a few ways. So with us, we get what's called the Monday morning report. And that's something that a lot of groups use. And that basically tracks all of your key metrics. So it's going to track everything from, uh, you know, from how many leases you have coming up for expiration, how many of those units are pre-leased, how many evictions you have filed, how many leads you've had, how many applications were submitted. So it's going to track all of your key metrics that determine the overall health of your property. And you'll also get a financial package from your property management company each month. Uh, but the only thing is, you don't want to wait till once a month to adjust if there's a problem. So that's the benefit to getting that Monday morning report. You're seeing these numbers on a weekly basis, because ultimately, the, the byproduct of those numbers will be what you see on your monthly financials. So if there's a problem, so for instance, if you have, you know, and I'm just using an example, let's say if you get 25 leads and only two of them submit applications, okay, well, where's the disconnect? Uh, was, our, was our leasing team not well equipped enough to sell them on it? Was, were the units not attractive enough? Were they priced too high? Well, you know, where's the disconnect? So our job as asset management isn't to be so much involved in the minutia, but to chart the course and to make sure that the ship stays on that course. So we have to give the property manager guidance, let them know what our plan is, and then help them execute it. So they'll be doing the everyday stuff. Our job is to stay in touch with them and to stay on top of them. And my philosophy to it is, yes, I want to be involved. Yes, I want to be aware. But no, I don't want to be a total pain in the butt. Maybe a little bit, but not total. And, and, and you know, I always tell them, I said, listen, I want you to know that I'm there. I said, I'll probably never be the guy that, you know, you'll, you'll forget that I'm around. But I don't want to be a pain in the butt to the point where I make it tough for you to do your job. I, I want to support you. I want to give you what you need, make sure you have the tools, make sure you have the money and enable you to do the best job that you need to, because it benefits everybody. Wow. Um, yeah. So what are some things you do to help keep the ship on course? Let's say you, you find out that it's not going the way you want. What are some things that you as the asset manager can do to get them back on track? Well, thankfully, and eventually I'm sure this will change, but thankfully I haven't had that experience yet. Uh, what I would say is that I think part of the reason for that is good planning and clear expectations. And I always tell people that that's really what you need to do from the beginning. You, you want to train your property manager how you like them to work. And, and I'm not saying that I want them to redesign their business for me because you know, that, that's not practical. But when you're managing my property, this is how I want you to do it. You know, and it may not be exactly, but we have to find some type of common ground where it works for them and works for me. And we'll say, okay, these are our projections for year one. So like, like our 48 unit property in Sumter. So when we closed on it, we gave them a copy of our year one projections. And we said, okay, this is our Bible. So we need to live and die by these numbers. And, you know, we, we need to do whatever we can to hit them. So, so the thing is, uh, you might remember earlier in the broadcast that I said 750 was kind of the number I was targeting on that property. So we had 675 in year one because I, I really broke that into two years. So we're actually doing fairly good on that right now, being releasing units at 850. But, but that being said, it's setting those expectations. So we want to let the manager know, listen, this is what we expect of you. This is what we projected for the financial performance of the property. Uh, this is how we want to see it executed. Um, so so we had a kickoff call as soon as we closed on the property. We had all the partners on along with the property manager. We said, okay, you know, what do you need from us to, to achieve this goal? Here's the end goal. Now let's reverse engineer it and figure out what you need to do and what you need from us to help you do it. And, and then the key is you're staying in touch on a regular basis. So like every Tuesday afternoon with that property, we have a, a conference call with the property manager, myself and one or two of the other partners. So that way it keeps us abreast. So we get the Monday morning report to review that. 
Then Tuesday, we discuss it. We discuss any issues they might have. And, and the key is really just effective communication and being available. Um, you know, most times I either pick the phone up or I call back fairly quick. So I think that goes a long way and just staying on top of it. And so that, you, that, that's the real key. So now that you kind of know what the numbers should be, because you have some experience, do you give the property manager the budget that you're expecting or do you tell them to create one for you? So I work in tandem with them. So what I would usually do is I would come up with my own budget and then I'll go to them and say, what do you think? Is this practical? And they'll tell me, you know, okay, this looks good. This looks good. Maybe this is off. So th then we'll work on it together and fine tune it and, and go from there. And then after we actually close on it, then I'll make sure they have the copy of the budget. So we're working with the same thing. Is that budget coming from your underwriting? Yeah. Have you ever ran into an issue where, you know, the property manager gave you a budget and you knew they were either sandbagging it or they were running it way too lean to get the business? No, because th thankfully, I, being I have at least some knowledge of it, I, I, I wouldn't allow that. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, if you're somebody new just starting out, you may not have that expertise. So what I would tell you is to feel out a few different property management companies. And, and what, one thing we do, and, and this is effective, uh, I'll bite probably not to be the light of the property management companies. We have a 93 question interview process. We do. And, and I do, I do not recommend doing that like, first time you meet somebody because that will totally turn them off. Most times I'm dealing with the property manager for months before we actually hire them for something. And usually as we're getting ready to hire them, I tell them, listen, we do have an interview and I, I, I tell them straight up, it's probably going to take the better part of two hours. So if you want to do it outside of normal hours, I'm perfectly fine with that. I actually prefer it because it doesn't kill both of our days. But I said, before we hire you, we, we are going to do this. And it, it basically accounts for just about every question you could think of that you'll need to know. And at the end of it, one of the last things is I also ask for three references. And you want to actually contact those references. Don't just write them down. Actually pick the phone up and call them and listen to what other people say. So you'll hear some that are, you know, generally people are giving you references that are, that are probably going to speak very highly of them anyway. So you probably don't get too many bad things, but you may get some nuggets. So like one property management company that we're hiring now, even though I am very confident in them, uh, one of the references gave me probably the most glowing review I've ever heard of any property management company. So I said, wow, I, I was impressed. You would almost think he's getting paid at that, at that type of endorsement, but that was great. Um, but I said, okay, seems sincere. Then the second one was, was, was mixed. He was honest. He said, there's a lot of things they do well, uh, but then he was telling me I'm not happy with this, this, and this. And I said, okay, that, that's kind of what I wanted to hear. You know, I, I want to hear both sides of it and see, you know, where do their current clients find that they do well for them? Where do they find that they could use improvement? And that way I can help manage, one, my expectations of them, and two, manage them in a way that will get the best result out of it. So mm -hmm. you have to figure out how to work with somebody in a way that's conducive to how they want to receive information and then make it beneficial for everybody. Well, Charles, I wanted to get to our next section of the show that we call the fast five. And sure. it's the same five questions we ask everyone. All right, let's get to it. Question number one is if you were in your early twenties and you had to start all over again, how would you do that? The first thing I would say is probably take action. Uh, for me personally, I think the biggest mistake I made was, was learning a lot, but not doing as much. And I got too complacent in my job. So I, I would say, even if you don't know as much, take action and do something. The sooner you start, the sooner you'll be successful, yeah. even if you make a few mistakes along the way. The price of inaction is almost always greater than the price of failure. Correct. There's some, there's some situations where that doesn't apply. But <laughs> that's, that's as long as you're still breathing, it's okay. <laughs> right, right. If it's not life or, life or death. <laughs> Question number two, how do you see young professionals adding the most value to experienced operators in this space? It's a good question. Uh, I would say what they should probably do is reach out to somebody who's experienced and see how they could help them. Where is it that their business is lacking? And if it's somebody who's older, perhaps it may be on more of a technical basis, maybe, maybe with some digital marketing through social media content, uh, things that younger people are more savvy with that older ones aren't. Uh, thankfully I'm not quite that old yet. I'm kind of in between, but, but you know, for that, that's one way that comes to mind and, uh, just seeing where are the holes in that person's business that they could offer value. 
Beautiful. So question number three is what's the biggest mistake you've made in your career and how have you since adjusted your business? So with this one here, it's tough to choose just one, but what I would say probably more than anything, I guess that would be the underlying root cause of all the larger ones I've made is my ability to be very stubborn. And I think that that's something that, you know, people have given me good advice and advice that made a lot of sense and, and advice that I've given to other people on podcasts and that on a regular basis, uh, but I just didn't listen to it. And maybe, maybe I was stupid. Maybe I was arrogant. I don't know what it was, but I'm, I'm more of the approach that, okay, you can tell me the stove is hot, but until I stick my hand on the stove and get burnt, I don't fully believe it. So uh, I definitely did more of sticking my hand on the stove and getting burnt than I probably should have. And, and if I was less stubborn and more open to listening from the beginning, it probably would have moved a lot faster. <laughs> yeah, you only have to do that one time, though. There's, there's You'll two learn ways. the lesson. <laughs> I'd say there's two ways to learn, and the easy way and the hard way. The easy way. I almost always pick the hard way. <laughs> yep, the hard way is going through the shit. Um, <laughs> question number four: What's been your favorite way to incorporate technology and social media into your business? So, with social media, it's really just sharing content. I, I certainly wouldn't consider myself an expert at it. You know, there's certain, sometimes I get decent engagement, other times I get none at all. So, it's a it's a work in progress. I'm still learning, but I find that. It's a good way just to connect with people. And the biggest benefit, I think, to social media right now during the lockdown and the pandemic is that you can meet people that you wouldn't have had the chance to connect with otherwise. So right. for me, I use LinkedIn. I use Bigger Pockets. Those are my primary ones that I, I focus on for business purposes. And I connect with people just to, to reach out and say hello. And I, you know, a lot of times people connect with me on LinkedIn that if I see they're in the same space, I accept them. Then we start a conversation. The, the last thing you want to do is accept somebody's request and not reach out and say hello. That's a wasted attempt. Always use that as an attempt to reach out. And, and who knows what that person may wind up becoming. They may be a future partner. They may eventually invest with you. They may just be you know, somebody you say hi and bye to, but you never know what will come of it. So take advantage of it. And especially why it's tougher to meet people in person. Meet as many as you can online. Well, question number five, hopefully this is an easier answer, is what book has been most influential to you along your journey? And it could be a movie or a podcast. You know, It doesn't have to be a book. So, so for me, my favorite book of all time is How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Mm -hmm. And I would say that I would pick that. I read that when I was 19. My mindset was probably was definitely a lot different than it is now. And I wasn't nearly as much of a people person as I am now. So I think that book really opened my eyes because it has a lot of common sense principles. Uh, but sometimes common sense isn't always common. And it does a great job of reminding us the, the benefits of dealing with people properly and how that can benefit us. Uh, it can benefit us both personally and professionally. And keep in mind, what we're really in in real estate or syndication is a people business. So you want people to know you, you want people to like you, you want people to trust you because those things are going to be important if you're ever expecting to attract investors or any type of success to you. That's a great book too. I love that book. Well, Charles, thanks so much for joining us on today's episode of the Millennials and Multifamily Podcast. If anyone wants to reach out to connect or learn more about you, what's the best way for them to do that? Sure. So what I would say is... Um, let me, let me throw a quick plug out there. So every Saturday, I host an underwriting session for free on Zoom. And what I would tell people is if they're interested in attending, they should either text 347-306-3278 or email charles at threeoaksmanagement.com. That's the number three, O-A-K-S-M-G-M-T.com. All right. Well, Charles, thank you. me on your show. <laughs> That's right. Well, Charles, thanks so much for joining us today. This has been an absolute blast and we really appreciate your time. Guys, thank you very much for having me. It's been a blast as well. Thank you for listening to the Millennials and Multifamily Podcast brought to you by Kronos Investment Partners. If you enjoyed the show, please leave us a rating and a written review at iTunes so that we can connect with more people. Finally, head on over to KronosInvestmentPartners.com and sign up for our newsletter so you can stay updated on everything we're doing. If you're interested in partnering with us as we find new opportunities, you can also schedule a phone call with us under the Contact Us tab 
at chronosinvestmentpartners.com.